All right, well, welcome. We'll go ahead and I hate to curtail your your wonderful conversations and love and connection, but we'll go ahead and grab a seat if you can. And I uh, want to welcome you who are here on site. Those of you who are online as well, I know a number are traveling today, um, and, uh, but we want to welcome you, whether you're tuning in uh, live here or online. I'm going to just go through a couple of announcements. We got kind of a special morning. We got some baby dedications. We got some special visit. We got a lot going on this morning, so it's just going to be kind of a fun morning. Excited to be able to share this with you. Real fast, if you would, grab a bulletin maybe somewhere around you, and I want to just go through a few quick announcements here. Um, on the inside, I want to let you know of just a few things. Again, Tuesday Refresh, we'd love to see you out at the ranch. Um, we have Italian night Tuesday night, so drop in if you're able. Um, and then there's also, again, other uh, midweek studies that you're able to uh, check into, so there's information on that. I um, want to also mention, again, mark your calendars September 11th um, for that conference. We will do it. We're still looking for the location to be able to do it since we can't do it here. By uh, if we at, at random last necessity, if we need to do something and we don't have a place, we can stream it here on Sunday and do a whole day event here, but that's kind of a last ditch effort if we can't find a place and we're still looking for a thing or two, a place or two, um, and I'm, I'm just waiting to hear back. But we're excited to do that. Let your friends know that uh, we'll be planning on that on September 11th. Again, that location to be determined, but we're looking forward to that. I also want to mention there's going to be a work day at the Pritchett's coming um, on July 31st. That's next Saturday. There's Jeff at the back. Talk with him. They've, he's been doing, they've been trying to do as much as they can by themselves, but they'd appreciate some help as they're trying to sell their house, and I believe try to just get out of debt. So we want to help them in that and, uh, and, and all the stuff they've been going through lately. So if you're able, come check that out. A lunch is provided. Message Jeff if you could to met, let them know who's all coming, and uh, I'd love to see you there. We'll plan on being there. Um, also, there is a new website up, just so you know. I don't know if any of you guys had seen that, but this week we have a new website up. You can check it out at cbcwichita.com, and now there's online giving available on there. I know many of you have been waiting for that for a long time, um, and we're excited to be able to provide that, and we thank you for those who've already given online like that. Uh, we do want to encourage localized giving again so that PayPal doesn't get the almost 3% you know, off the top cut kind of thing that they do. But that's kind of about the going rate for wherever you go uh, doing, using online option giving. So, uh, but that's all right. So uh, if you want to give online, give online. You have that opportunity. You can also give, I think, at the end. There's a box at the back. Uh, there's a thing at the back there that you can do that as well. And we thank you for the faithful giving here at Calvary. A couple of things real fast. I know the, the sound techie folks, uh, give them a round of applause for doing. Look at this. You know what? We came in this morning. And it's just, it's amazing. We come in and then it's it just a few minutes later and it's all here because it just all wheels right in so nice and easy. It's just been such a cool creation that, that uh, Skinner's have put together. So we just really thank them for that. They'd love some help. Uh, there's a few people that are stepping back from being able to help on that weekly. And so if that's of interest to you in some way, shape, or form to be able to help, I mean, a lot of it's just kind of being aware of what you're doing and clicking a button. It's really not that hard, um, and on, at least as it relates to graphics. There's some sound stuff that you could learn, too. We'd love to have your help on that. So if you're able and you're kind of interested in that or you're wondering how to plug in or be able to serve and connect with some people, that would be a big help. Um, we'd love for your help. Just talk to Valerie or Kurt, and they'll get you squared away on that. Um, one final thing. Uh, yeah, Nancy's got something here real fast. Uh, it's just, uh, you might remember when, before we moved, of course, this was the timing that we had, is that before we moved, we were trying to get together a, uh, a um, directory update. And so we got most everything in, but some of you were still working on information if you want to be in it. So um, if, if you have not turned in information, Nancy's got these. Uh, you just talk with Nancy. She'll get your information. We want to put that out so that people have that uh, directory. So uh, anyway, check, uh, talk to Nancy. Check on that if you can before you leave. That would be um, wonderful. I think that's it for announcements, unless I miss something, and that's the wonderful time that you can get up and throw your donut at me or something like that. If not, I want to let you know that you can always check the newsletter online um, that comes out every Tuesday. If you want to be part of that, never hesitate. You can give me your email and I'll put you on that list um, also. So uh, a couple of things real quick, and there's actually no um, particular order, but Wade, would you come on up? Wade Graber, a good friend uh, from previous ministry days, got to work with him at Cal uh, First Baptist Church in El Dorado. 
Um, you might remember he was here filling in so graciously when we were in the hospital with Joey. And so it just came out and it worked out that we don't have any elder, local elders here today because they're all out of town. And so great, so, uh, Wade so graciously uh, 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 was willing to come and to, to pray blessing over our dead baby dedication that we're doing and families over here. We're going to be able to share in that. But before we do that, if you don't mind, Wade, you just got back not too long ago from Sierra Leone. And, uh, and you might remember Wade shared two or three years ago at our missions banquet a little bit about the ministry that they're doing in West Africa. And uh, I just like this as he got back and he's fresh off the field. We'd love to hear a little bit about what's going on. Uh, maybe share. He kind of sent out a good um, a good update this morning. And so just some of that stuff would be great. You got to watch okay. your cables. But good to see you, Wade. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Our joy to be back. Uh, if I do fall asleep during the message, don't take it personally. We're still jet lagging a little bit here. But, uh, you know, grace of God, uh, we initially were starting the church planting in Liberia, West Africa. Uh we crossed the border into Sierra Leone. And so this, this training um, was very exciting because what the essence of it was to introduce the Sierra Leone uh, leaders uh, to the church planting curriculum. And so grace of God, if things, uh, they said, yes, we're a go. And they are each lining out 15 people to train. So grace of God, at the end of this year, we will have planted 75 churches in Sierra Leone. Grace of God. Then, you know, how he orchestrates things, it's so cool because one of the leaders we met in Liberia, uh, he, uh, I always call him a big dog, but he's a church consultant and has been for eight years in Sierra Leone. He and his wife met Peggy and I uh, in Liberia at a conference. We were both uh, presenters. And one of the things at that conference is we were supposed to introduce uh, the whole vision of church multiplication. So at the end of that, he says, come to Sierra Leone. So the bridge is built there. This guy now, Bahago, is now moving back to Nigeria, where he's from, at the end of this year, probably November. And so he sat through the training, <laughs> the new training, and said, I want to be a country coordinator for Nigeria. And guess which country they've assigned to us next? Nigeria. It's just so cool to see God do this. So please pray for us. Uh, we don't know what we're doing, but we trust God knows what he's doing. So he just keeps connecting the dots. And so we'll uh, try and get uh, to uh, uh, Ghana in, in September, meet with supervisors from all over Africa. We're up to 23 countries now that are doing this training. And, of course, the, the overall umbrella vision is to plant a church in every village in Africa by the year 2050. Wow. So that's the vision accompanied with the overall umbrella vision to present the gospel to one billion people by 2026, which started in 2016. So that's a nutshell. Wow. Praise the Lord. That's cool. Awesome. Thank you for letting us know what's going on in, in the, the uh, West Africa movement, but then in Nigeria. That is exciting. You, you actually can keep that. I'll let okay. you keep that one. And I'll go ahead and have the family come up with the star of the show today, little baby Josiah. So let's go ahead and family, you guys can all come up. Yep, and all everybody come up. We're going to test the space <laughs> constraints up here. But we'll go ahead and have everybody come on up, family-wise. You guys go ahead. You guys, go, you guys all come on up, if that's all right. We'll see. Jeff, Kim, you guys come on up. You guys all come on up. Let me see if everybody, Marilyn, Bob, come on up. Okay. Huh? Yeah, Josh and Lori, if, if, they're, if you're able, come on up. Yeah, yep. Because we want to we wanna do this all together. Now, girls, you might have you, we might have you sit, sit beside. I mean, you're awesome, and you always get the attention, but jo Josiah is going to be the main thing here today. Okay. Well, you know, we didn't necessarily have this all planned, but as we began our study in 1 Samuel chapter 1 last week, it just it, it came to us that I think this is a good time and, uh, and that we would uh, want to offer... Josiah to the Lord for what he's done for us. It's been so cool to see. Um, and, and hopefully you've been able to be blessed to see the, the posts and the, the encouraging updates. And um, um, he's been doing awesome. So even without a pacifier, he does pretty good. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, so, so we, uh, we want to do this together as a family. That we, we offer him to the Lord 
Um, and so there's going to be something that we kind of do back and forth in this time, and uh, we just encourage you to take part in that. And so we'll just go ahead and hit the first slide if you don't mind. And I'm going to go ahead and try to act as pastor and parent <laughs> uh, in the middle of this uh, first, and then uh, you'll be able to join in on the response as well. But, but parents, so you and I, Julie... <laughs> Um, actually, Wade, would you mind if you don't mind reading the yellow, I'll go and for then it. and then I'll then I'll play parent here. Okay, Jim and Julie, will you love and raise Josiah in the fear and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ, doing your best to share Jesus through your life's example before Him? We will. Will you endeavor to share Jesus with Josiah, praying for and encouraging him to personally accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior? We will. We will. Amen. And then family, family gets to join in on this next one, if you don't mind. All right. Family, will you encourage? Family, will you encourage <laughs> and help the Galliards to love and care for Josiah and the fear and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ, doing your best to share Jesus through your life's example before him? We will. And will you pray for Josiah and his parents regularly, especially for God's direction for him and for his salvation in Jesus Christ? We will. And then, then you guys, now if you don't mind standing, <laughs> so we do this together before the Lord, the congregation. And church family, congregation, will you serve, pray for, and encourage the Galliards in raising Josiah in Christ, doing your best to share Jesus through your life's example before him? We will. And will you do your part as God allows to help share Christ with Josiah in the honor and fear of the Lord, praying also for his salvation and growth in Christ? We will. We will. Amen. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all. Would you pray for us, Wade? We'll come all forward right. here. Well, Josiah, sweet boy, what a great moment. You may not remember <laughs> all this. He wants to talk, I think. Yeah, yeah there That's you go. That's what he does when he wants to start talking. This is a great moment. You may not remember, but your mom and dad love you. Your sisters love you. And we are so thrilled about what God's already doing in your life. You know, Josiah means Jehovah has healed. Amen. And he's been healing and ministering, and he's been healing stuff in us that we didn't know needed healed just through you already. Amen. And so we are trust that part of your life and ministry is just a healing that's not only received, but God pours out through you. So we're praying that anointing and blessing for you as well. So we're excited one of these days when you meet Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior. It's just going to be the thrill of your soul. And you're just going to love him to pieces just like he loves you. I know. Isn't that exciting? I'm excited too. Well, let's pray, okay? Love you, Jesus. Bless you. Worship you. We thank you for the gift of Josiah. We thank you, Lord, for how you've invented him. All you've breathed into him is happening and that we could celebrate this day. Lord, we pray your anointing and blessing and covering over him. Lord, he'd be your choice servant. And Lord, he'd just grow up to hate sin and love righteousness yes. and just have you deep in his heart, Lord, have the realities of the joy of salvation and be, Lord, the one who just honors you in all things. We bless you and worship you. We pray your anointing and covering over him and over his family and the future that you set before him. Lord, we bless you in Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. God Amen. bless Amen. you. Amen. <laughs> thank you. Amen. Right. Okay. Wow. Cool. All righty. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, family, for coming. Thank you, Wade. Appreciate it. I should have had you continue standing, but that's all right. We gave your legs just a little bit of a break. But would you mind if you don't, if, and if you're able, uh, would you stand as we continue in worship together this morning? We're going to be looking at our psalm from Psalm 34, verses 8 through 10. Uh, it'll be on the screen above, and I'll have the worship team go ahead and come on up at this time. But Psalm 34, 8 through 10, would you say with me and I'll pray. Psalm 34, 8 through 10, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Would you pray with me, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here before you, Lord. 
We ask that you would bless and encourage and strengthen your church, Lord, and in, in all of these things, that we come as we pray and as we worship and as we, we learn in your word, as we fellowship with one another, Lord, would your spirit be present? Would you, you consecrate, set our hearts and, and our lives, Lord, apart, Lord, for your service and your work? Would you, would you help us to see that, God, you're doing a great and wonderful thing uh, in and among us while we uh, dig into First and Second Samuel together? Lord, we thank you for the deep and great change that you want to bring. Uh, so, Lord, today we want to prepare our hearts, Lord, in worship, and we pray that, uh, Lord, no thing would get in the way of, of connecting with you. Uh, Lord, if there are concerns or cares that are in our minds or in our hearts right now, we want to cast those onto you, Lord, because you definitely care for us. And, Lord, we want to be able to, to worship you in spirit and in truth today, unhindered, Lord, seeing you for who you are. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us in this time. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the wonderful joys that it is that we have in your presence, and it's all because of Jesus. And we thank you in his name we pray. Amen. Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame, all because of your love. Maker of the universe, broken for Oh 
of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life i freely give because of your love because of your love i live you know i was thinking when wade was here and that was when baby Josiah was born. That was April. And how much has changed in three, four months. And I just think it's awesome that, you know, at the moment things can seem so overwhelming. And I think that's just God telling us to trust in him and just look to him when it gets too overwhelming. Um, so I hope this set does that for you and, and just draws your eyes on him when it seems a little overwhelming. As we go ahead and begin this morning, we want to turn our attention to our giving while we don't pass a plate now, especially in the time of COVID. 
We want to go ahead and make sure that we pray over the gifts that are given this morning, and we want to thank you again for the gifts that are given. And uh, I'm not I'm not Graham, so uh, beg your pardon, but uh, anyway, we do want to take time and pray for that, and then we will dismiss for Children's Church. So would you pray with me? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the wonderful opportunity it is to be here and to not just receive, but to give. And Lord, we thank you that the ways in which you are working and moving and showing yourself faithful to this congregation uh, is uh, even most tangibly seen in, Lord, the great giving and the great efforts and sacrifices of your people. And so we thank you for moving in their hearts and in their minds, Lord, to continue the work that you uh, are continuing in doing the great work in Calvary Bible Church. So we pray that as we provide um, our lives, our minds, our hearts, and Lord, even those financial resources today, that you would take those and multiply those uh, for your glory and for the name of Jesus Christ to be known, um, Wichita, Kansas, all throughout the world, Lord. And we thank you for how you want to purpose that in what we give. And so we thank you and praise you, and we turn our hearts over to you in this time of study and uh, reflection on your word. So we ask your blessing, Lord, help me move out of the way, and would your Holy Spirit come speak words of life to your church. And we thank you and give you this time. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and dismiss children for Children's Church so they can go ahead and head on back to that area. And the rest of you, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and turn your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1. We'll be back in chapter 1 just for a little bit to remind you we began a new study in 1 Samuel last week uh, in I guess a series we could call Deep, in talking about the deep uh, changes that God brought to the nation of Israel during the time of Samuel, and the, really the judge that he uh, brought through Samuel, being the last judge, as we uh, talked about in kind of the placement of this book in the Old Testament. And uh, so the, the, the deep needed changes that had to come to Israel, but then knowing that you and I need deep cleaning, deep changes. And maybe if you coming into this study uh, thought, man, I am up a creek, pal. I need help. Uh, then this study is for you because the Lord has got some great things that he's done in the work and life of Samuel that we're going to see providing change to what seemed to be a lost cause in Israel, even at the time that he uh, began serving there. So just a bit of a review before we begin. Actually, today the message, if I would title it, would be More Than a Conqueror, and we'll get to that. Now, that's me, by the way, just so you know, right? <laughs> Taking the picture. Not even that, okay? But anyway, just to make sure you're awake. All right, a bit of review. Um, Remember, again, big changes needed in Israel, and we saw some of that even at the, the, the tabernacle, how worship was being brought about at the tabernacle. Just some strange things that were happening. Remember, after the judges, Israel uh, occupied the land, but uh, it went through ebbs and flows, valleys and peaks of following the Lord and not. And then whenever they wouldn't, God would raise up a judge, right, and, uh, and spare them or save them as they called out to him in repentance. And so we went through that in the book of Judges, but going into Samuel being the last judge, as many Bible commentators see, uh, just a lot of changes needed in Israel. And, and so we're introduced in chapter 1 to Elkanah, Parana, which you know that's a mistake there, but it's intentional because Paniah was more like a Parana rather than living up to her name. Remember, her name meant Ruby. She was not much of a gem, though. And Hannah, Hannah was also mentioned as the favored one, right? And so we talked about that. Now, now Hannah, you might remember... Uh, was dogged by Paniah about her barrenness. And in the middle of going year after year after year to worship, even though the priesthood was extremely corrupt, even though going to the temple there could have been plenty of excuses not to go, still this family went year after year. And in the middle of going, they still struggled going to church. Can I get an amen? Did anybody have any tough time going to church this morning? Yeah? Yeah, mama back there, right? Yeah. And they struggled going to the tabernacle, and they were bickering and arguing and fighting, especially as it related to Hannah's barrenness. And so whenever Hannah came to the tabernacle to offer sacrifices unto the Lord, she just was bitter in heart. In fact, it came to a head. It came to a point where, in, as we read last week in chapter 1, this was an exceptional time of bitterness and sorrow in her heart. And literally, she broke as we looked at last week, and she broke, but in a beautiful way. 
in such a way that now, at this point in time, as everything kind of culminates to this, her heart becomes aligned with God's will. Even though God provided and produced, as it said very clearly in chapter 1, the barrenness that she was dealing with, uh, probably even provisionally, providentially put the piranha, paniah, allowed her to be in her life. God was working all these things to this beautiful moment where God broke Hannah and aligned her heart with his will. And and in the middle of that, we talked about it, it was quite an interesting sight that Eli saw. He wasn't sure what to make of it, thinking that she had just had a little too many and somehow snuck some brewskis into the tabernacle somehow and told her to put them away. And instead, she said, no, you don't get it. I'm praying. And she explained the prayer. And in the middle of all of that, Eli realized what was going on. And by the power of the Spirit, what was going on, blessed Anna, she conceived not long after that and later returned with Samuel. Now, that's where we pick things up. So turn with me, if you would, 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting back in verse 24, getting a little bit of a running start because there's some things here that we need to cover before we get into chapter 2. It says here in verse 24, Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls. Now some of your translations say one bull. Uh, Ultimately, we know that one bull has a destiny here that we're going to talk about here in a bit. Um, Either way, it could be uh, rendered that way. Now one ephah of flour, which is about 36 pounds of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought those to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Now, we don't exactly know how young. Could he have been a few years old? Uh, could he have been? Now, we know from Josephus that he doesn't receive the call in a few chapters later uh, until he's probably 11 years old. So when we think of young, he's coming to serve in <laughs> the, the tabernacle at a pretty young age for sure. Um, whether he's a toddler here or a young child, we don't know for sure, but we do know that she is fulfilling her promise. You know, the child was young. Verse 25, then they slaughtered a bull. That's the one. And what happened to the other two? But, or if it was just one, we don't know. But he, they slaughtered that bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, or as, yeah, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here. Praying to the Lord, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord. And literally, it means returned him to the Lord. It's not as though, you know, he's on loan, you know, to the Lord. He is the Lord. That's what she acknowledges. I've returned him to the Lord, that is. As long as he lives, he shall be lent or returned to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. Now, understand this, as joyful as this appears in wanting to dedicate Josiah, not Josiah, well, as we did Josiah, but Samuel at the temple, can you imagine she is giving, listen, understand that she is giving her only son. Does that ring a bell? And it might even make you think of a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. Remember when Abraham offered Isaac up on the altar? A little bit older, from what we understand. But willing to put the promise on the line. Handing him over. Great, extreme sacrifice. Uh, Imagine how tough this was. And, And it wasn't as tough as maybe it can be around your house when the desserts come out and your kids come out as well. In fact, you know, I've learned, in fact, we had a whole bunch of pie left, some pie left over from Tuesday night, and it was so good, and, and it was out on the, you know, it was out there, and, 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 and I, I told Julie, I, I was thinking I might share some with her, and then, and then she really laid the guilt trip on me, but then, and then the girls really laid the guilt trip on me the next day, Dad, where's the pie, you know, right? Well, honestly, I ate some, and I didn't share some, I should have, but oftentimes they come out, and they're like, Dad, can I have that last piece, and it's like, oh. It's hard to give some things up, isn't it? Now, it's really easy when you take the scale that's in your bathroom and put it out in the kitchen because it's just kind of lurking there in the background. Yeah, you can have it. (laughs) Right? As you get older, you know what I mean. But this is simply different. This is giving. I I mean, think about it. What are the toughest things that you maybe have had to give up up and, and, and put yourself in her shoes and imagine how hard this would be? 
But that would be hard unless you'd realize, and as it's written here, even though, again, some of the translations don't really show it very well, you realize that that child isn't even yours to begin with. Those things that you have really are the Lord's, provisionally and and providentially given to you, on loan to you. There's something about her heart coming to leave her only son that just seems to be like she's something else now. She ain't the same a few years ago, Hannah, boo-hoo, and because things weren't going her way in the temple. No, something has changed to where even the tough, one of the toughest things I can imagine she's even gone through in her life up to this point, she's doing with a totally different heart. It's amazing. Now, she's realizing the, the deep need of sacrificial worship. Now, it's interesting in what she brings and, and, and what you and I are encouraged to bring, even to the Lord's house, whether it be His helping hands or wherever. I, I want you to see something here that's interesting, and, and she's, she's picking up on it as she brings these things. What were the three things? She brought a bull, she brought the ephah of flour, which represents bread, and she brought wine. Well, bread and wine, we know, is what? It's symbolic of what? Communion, the table, right? And, and, and the sacrifice, that, the, the bull. Now, it's not a lamb, but it's, it's a bull. It's, it's an animal that needs to be sacrificed. It, it is there to consecrate him or to, to cover him as he goes into the ministry. What's interesting here is we get a picture here of worship as it relates to even me and to you. Now, You and I, fortunately, we don't have to bring bulls and goats and have to sacrifice those things. That would make my job a little bit less enjoyable. Because Christ has done that for me and for you. He was the sacrificial animal, the lamb that was slain for you and for me. Now, ultimately, he is... The, the bread and the wine, too, right? Because whenever we come to communion, we're, we're, we're not drinking of our own flesh and blood. We, we're looking and, and eating of our own flesh and drinking of our own blood. We're looking to Him, right, in that. But there is something that is very interesting in what Jesus asks of you and me at the table. Because He tells us very clearly, doesn't He, to do this in remembrance of me. Uh, that is to say, fortunately, now you guys came here and maybe you're sweating bullets right now thinking, okay, if we're talking about sacrificial worship, and okay, if I'm really going to start living a life sold out like, like Hannah and really seeing deep change in my life, maybe I'm going to have to start bringing some really hefty stuff and start giving it over to the Lord. But now you might be able to see that, hey, Jesus did a lot for you to not have to do those things. However, he does require some things of you and me. Did you know that? In sacrificial worship, did you know that there are things that you and I are expected to bring on a regular basis? It says here in 1 Peter chapter 1, 5, it's up on the screen, sacrifices that are even asked of us in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1 reminds us that you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Did you know you bring sacrifices today? Spiritual sacrifices. But you bring sacrifices today. In fact, Hebrews 13, you can turn there if you want to. Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, 15 through 16 reminds it or reminds us or puts it like this. It says, through Jesus, through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips, as it says in some of your translations, openly professing his name, not forgetting to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. You know, for some of us, it's easy to do that last part. It's easy to give things up a lot easier than it is to to sing at church. That is one thing that's a little bit different, isn't it, as a worship leader, to come and see y'all when you're singing or not. Like, even mouth it, folks. <laughs> you don't have to impress anybody. In fact, it's a duty. It, hurt, it burdens me. Folks, listen, and, and I don't mean to dog you. I'm not, I understand. I've been there. In fact, we are there. One of our girls has been really digging some songs on Caleb, and, you know, the piano thing, they've got down pretty well. The singing, we got to work on. But 
man, um, and it can be rough, I get it. Um, but folks, listen, you and I are called to bring the sacrifice of praise, the, the fruit of our lips. And it's not just singing, it's what we say. It's proclaiming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ wherever we go, whatever we do. That's the sacrifice he has called you and I to do. That's why he asked you and I to remember him in communion so that we would come and we would worship him, we would declare him as our Lord and Savior when we come to the table and say, I throw myself on the table of his grace and his mercy, I need him. And, and that's the sacrifice you and I bring. That's what you and I are called to do when we gather together. Again, it, it doesn't have to be a beautiful sound. It just needs to be a sure sacrifice of praise. Uh, lay that before the Lord. Bring that. Bring that. The, Jesus has covered the bull sacrifice, the, the, the flour and the wine you and I get to take part in on a regular basis. Bringing that sacrifice unto the Lord. In fact, ultimately, the, the goal... <laughs> The goal, as seen here in Hannah, again, totally changing the dynamic of the heart, is total sacrifice. You know, it's one thing to, okay, Jim, yeah, okay, I'll start mouthing the words now. And hopefully you mean them, even if you mouth them, that you mean them. And that you you sing them because God is worthy of that praise. He's worthy of you speaking those things. He's given you the breath to, to speak it out. You better use it. But, but even more so, the, the, I think that the goal in Hannah that we see and the goal in you and in me to be able to endure at the beginning on the onset of tough stuff, hard decisions, big moves in life, is total sacrifice. It, it says, Paul says in, in Philippians 3, 8, I consider, and, and he's talked about his past there in chapter 3 and, and you know, being a being a Pharisee and, and being you know, part of the priest, all, all those kind of things, amazing stuff, but I counted all that, all that a loss. But then he, he, he ups the ante in verse 8. He says, I consider everything, everything a loss because of the su- surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For Christ, I have lost everything. I am totally surrendered to whatever his will is because I realize that I'm in his boat now. I realize that I'm in his care now. And in fact, I would say, in continuing on with this thought of being more than a conqueror, Hannah is showing here that she is. Even in the Old Testament, she's more than a conqueror. And what do we mean by more than a conqueror? We were talking about this in Romans 8 in our senior center study at the senior center. Uh, Robert, he's not here. Um, But uh, Robert said, that's just a silly thing. How How can we be more than a conqueror? And it's an interesting thought. How can we be more than a conqueror? Well, conquerors have to, to prove who they are in winning. But you and I, listen, you and I, amazing, you and I are more than conquerors through him who loved us, as it says in Romans 8, 37. You and I are more than conquerors because I'll tell you why. You and I not only are guaranteed to win, you and I have already won. We, we are more than conquerors because it's game, set, match now. It's like the old comedian. He once shared that he would just love to see football played like chess, where you go out there and the quarterback goes up and he sees the line and he sees the defense looked up there. He just kind of steps back and shrugs his shoulder and he says, touchdown. Right? Because whenever you play chess, you sort of see the board and you look at checkmate. You don't even have to move. You win, right? You just see it, you know, and it's, it's over, game over, right? How silly would that be for, for football? And then he was also talking about how it'd be nice in life, this certain comedian. It was saying it'd be nice in life to, you know, when you make a decision to kind of keep your finger on the, the, uh, the game piece, right? So you could always go back, right? Amen. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, game, set, match. It's done. You and I are more than conquerors because the win is already given in every situation. In fact, I love what it says here. I'll get to, I'll, I'll, I've got to get to the next slide here. There we go. I want to, I want to share a little bit here about Romans 8. We'll get to 1 Samuel 2 sometime. Huh. Listen, now, in Romans 8, Paul is, first verses before this, 35 and 36, is talked about all kinds of sufferings and persecutions. We're delivered to death, it says in 36, all the day long. We encounter tough stuff, he says, in every situation, at every turn. You and I know that. But the promise that he is explaining in Romans 8 about being more than conquerors is clear. It says here, yet, aside from, nope. Yet, once it's all over, no, 
Yet in, in, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him. In, that means what is happening to me and to you, the tough thing that I've got to deal with, you know, whatever that might be, in it, that's where I find that I'm a conqueror. That's what God has ordained or allowed so that I, he can prove who he is to me and I can see who I am in him. Yes, yes. You and I are more than conquerors in it. Remember that. Don't run in the trial. Don't run what, from what you're going through, the tough stuff. You and I are more than conquerors in it. Hannah experienced this, and she proves that she does here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Amazing. Because we're going to talk about this, because look, it says here in chapter 2, verse 1, at the temple, continuing on, again, we, the chapter divisions were added later, chapter 2, verse 1, at the temple, when he's, she's delivering Samuel to Eli, she didn't boo-hoo, cry. It says, Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices. Now, before we continue, I want you to scoot on real quick to verse 10. And I'll give you the foundation of why she's so lit. Why she is just a, more than a conqueror right here. In verse 10, it says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. Now get this. It says, He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Or the horn is the strength of his anointed. Now, does Israel have a king at this point? No. No, they don't. No, they don't have a king. They have not, they have not gone that far yet. They will in Samuel's ministry, but not here. So who is this king that she's talking about? She's prophesying something here. And she's not only speaking of the, the saving kings of Israel like David and, and the work that, that they do. Listen, she's, she's announcing something prophetically that's amazing, that, that really revolutionizes, changes, the, the, not changes, but, but, but establishes, probably is the better word, the rest of the scriptures. Because it says, he and, or, and exalt, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. In the Hebrew, it's Messiah. In the Greek, it's Christ. In the English, it's the anointed one. She's the first one to identify the coming Savior as Messiah to where in, in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah quotes from this beautiful prayer that she prays. Uh, Mary, Mary quotes from this, identifying, realizing that she's going to be bearing the Christ child. David, uh, the, the prophets, a take from, from Hannah, realizing that the Messiah is coming. And this is the first time it's mentioned that way. The Savior's on his way. That's the foundation. That's how she is more than a conqueror. That is why we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us so very much. She realized it back even in the Old Testament here. There's a Savior on his way. It's amazing. It's very interesting. And that's the foundation you and I, as, as Pastor Wade reminded me, eyes on Jesus, right? Eyes on Jesus. Because that's the foundation of whatever you and I are struggling with, facing with, going through. Making big decisions, those kind of things. That was her foundation. That's why we started in verse 10. I know we're always backwards. Sorry, you, you got me for a pastor, so expect it. Back to verse 1. Back to verse 1. We're going to see... In these remaining minutes that we have, three ways in which Hannah, in this prayer, proves that she is more than a conqueror through Christ. And I think it's going to be helpful for me and for you, as it might change our prayer life, as hopefully it'll help us endure the hard things that you and I are going through, maybe the tough decisions you and I have to make, the sacrificial issues that we're going to have to deal with, the things we have to give up, the things that we have to see change in our life. The first one I want you to see, and this is, again, out of order. This is the pastor that you got, so go with it, is in verses 3 through 8. First off, if you're a note taker, she embraced his plan of humility to break her. She embraced his plan of humility to break. She wasn't just broken like she was back when she was with Eli in the temple a few years before. At this point, she embraced it. She realized what God was doing. Look with, you, with me, if you would, verse 3 and following. It says in verse 3, Talk no more, as she's praying, she's saying this, Talk more, no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord 
is a God of knowledge. It literally is the God who knows. He knows everything. That's what she's saying. He's the God who knows. And by Him, actions are weighed. Before we continue on, I want you to think of a scripture maybe that, that challenges you and me, realizing that you and I go through trials oftentimes, tough decisions, sacrificial situations, so that our hearts are tested or challenged. God has a purpose in why you and I go through what we're going through, and it's often to humble us, very specifically probably to humble us. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, too, you might remember it says this, remember... Again, God talking through Moses to the nation of Israel because of their wilderness wilderness wanderings. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you to know what was in your heart or literally to show what was in your heart. God knew all along, but to show what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commands or not. God sent us through the wilderness that rough patch, that wearisome time, why? It wasn't just biology. No, God had shut her womb. Uh, It wasn't just life because life stinks. No, God was sovereign over it. It wasn't just my accident that I had. No, God is in control, and he allowed it because he wants to teach you and to teach me to humble you, to test you, Folks, it says very clearly in James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and then he will exalt you. We have that the other way around. Maybe the Lord will exalt me and then I'll get the, the lesson and then I'll be a humble person. No, 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 no. Humble yourself before the Lord, and then he will lift you up. Then he will exalt you. First Samuel, back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. She continues, the, the bows of the mighty men, verse 4, are broken And those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves now out for bread. And the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven. And she who has many children has become feeble. That says something to me about her faith that we'll close with. Hold on to that. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes the poor, or makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth of the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. As I was looking at this scripture, it's neat to see, and one of the things I think you and I got to remember in embracing humility really embracing it, not just living through it, just, you know, biting my lip and getting a grip and going through it, but embracing it, is these wonderful stories of faith that she's bringing up in her mind. I've seen the, it's kind of like, I've seen the, 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 uh, the poor and the I've seen the poor exalted and the rich brought low. She's bringing up these instances in her mind, very similar to what David's going to write. Again, David brings inspiration from a lot of what Sam or what Hannah's written here, and, and she's inspired because she's noticed and seen the way in which God works, and she's sharing that. She's sharing that I see God how you're in control and how you're working humility in the rich and the poor, how you're bringing all these things about according to the ways just that you work. And in fact, I, I think of Job. I was thinking of Job in this. Why do you always have to bring up Job, Jim? Well, we're, just because. It's just so easy to identify with. Can I get an amen? Man, Job. My word, Job goes through so much. And, uh, and, and Job, in fact, I really don't have a lot of time, but bring about Job or check out Job uh, 42, 1 through 6, and you'll see, remember his response to the Lord. <laughs> the Lord lays it heavy on him. Job, of all people, what did he do, right? And yet the Lord in Job 42 used all that he went through to teach him humility. That was, what, that was the whole point, it's to bring him low, to see. And in fact, it says there, I think it's in verse 4 or 5, it says that I have heard God, but now I see him face to face. Now I see him face to face. I've been brought so low to look up, and now I see him. 
I was just hearing him looking around, living my life as I thought, as I should do it, planning my things. But when I got brought so low that I had to look up, now I see him face to face. That's what Job ultimately said, (laughs) other than forgive me, Lord, for everything else that I have said. That's God's plan of humility. God's plan of humility for me and you. We've got to learn to, in the middle of hard stuff, just embrace that God, you know what? You're teaching me something through this. God, you've got a plan for why I'm here and having to do this hard thing. God, I trust you. I'm more than a conqueror through you. I've already won in this battle. I just got to keep going, trusting you, looking to you, learning the lessons that he is teaching. But I, I do think that one of the things that helps us embrace this plan of humility to break us is that we do share the stories wherein God has brought the, the low to new heights. And he's done great things in people as he's taught them humility. And that's what she's doing here. And, and I don't know about you, but there's something that, that really soothes the heart when you're going through something, but you see somebody else have gone through the same thing, but God brought them out of the pit or brought them out. And it gives you hope and it gives you encouragement. In fact, it causes Hannah here, just what's amazing to say that he has brought even the barren to be able to bring forth seven children. There's something that has seeded that faith in her, knowing and trusting that God can do it. And I believe it's the stories that she's kind of recounting in her mind and in her heart that she's sharing. I've heard, God, you can do this. I've seen you doing this, Lord. And I trust you can do it for me, too. That kind of faith she brings is amazing. She embraced, though, this humility, this plan of humility that God brought to break her. You know, when you and I finally... (laughs) Realize that what we're going through, God has allowed. And not just we put up with it, we embrace it. God, I believe that you're doing a great thing in bringing me low. That's, that's, a, that's a place for some deep change and some great turnaround. Uh, the next thing I want you to see is this wonderful thing that she did at the beginning of this prayer. You want to be able to make it through some tough times. Embrace God's plan to bring you low. Number two, proclaiming the word to strengthen you. She proclaimed the word to strengthen her. Uh, If you go back with me to verse 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2, she begins this prayer like this. It says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. I'm not exalted or strengthened in the situation because it's tough. There's no way around it. But in the Lord, man, when I think about the Lord... I'm on a different plane. (laughs) I'm I'm in a different mindset. I'm more than a conqueror because of what he's doing. When I think about the Lord, I I rejoice in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. Happiness is not the absence of enemy or struggle. It's knowing what to do when they're around, right? (laughs) And that's what she's doing. I smile at my enemies. Why? Because I'm in the Lord. I'm safe in the Lord. Because I rejoice in your salvation. Verse 2, no one is holy like the Lord, for there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Now, when they say there's no rock like our God, that just sounds like a, a cute literary way of explaining God to us. But that meant something to an Israelite, right? Because when you're out in the desert and you're parched and it's hot, right, like it's been, and you need something to drink, and you know that there's a rock there that this crazy guy with a staff is saying, hey, if we just wait a little bit, there's going to be water coming out of that thing. Oh, okay. And then when it happens, and you realize this, as the writer of Hebrews writes, the rock, that is Christ. (laughs) That was him. (laughs) He was there providing in the desert, in the wilderness. Then you realize, boy, in whatever desert or wilderness I'm in, he's the rock. He's my provision. That's what she's saying here. And in fact, she is picking up on what is said in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, uh, quoting, as is written in Deuteronomy by Moses, he is the rock. His ways are perfect. She's quoting scripture right here. Right at the beginning of this prayer, she's quoting scripture. I I don't know about you, but some of the deepest and, and darkest and hardest times that I've been through, the only way out was to start rehearsing scripture or finding. I, I used to have a little, and, and, and I still do, I just don't get it out as much because I'm so fascinated by the whole Bible. 
But, but I, I used to have a, a little pocket book that had promises, a pocket book of promises of the Bible. And, and there were times in high school and in college, I, I'd thumb through that and, and gather a promise or two, and I, I'd just try to keep that in my mind when something wasn't going right or something wasn't setting well. And, and it was amazing to see how God would give me peace through His Word. Now, it's amazing, but it shouldn't be surprising because Jesus very clearly said, didn't he? In John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The only thing that can free you and I up and when you and I feel tangled up is God's word. It's God's word, speaking it, declaring it repeating it, meditating on it. In fact, that's what God tells Joshua to do in Joshua 1.8, right? Joshua 1.8, keep the book of the law always on your lips, Joshua is told. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do what is written in it and you will be prosperous and successful in what you do. When you keep the words of God on your lips, when you declare them in your life, when you speak them and believe them in your heart. She proclaimed his word and it strengthened her, even in this tough time of giving her only son. And I would encourage you and me, as it says very clearly in Ephesians 5, that you and I be filled with the Spirit, singing to one another psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always, right? Because that, that, that working of the Lord, when you and I speak His Word, when you and I speak His Word, it's the most effective and powerful thing, as it says in Isaiah 55, but it will not return void. It is powerful, living, and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Right? It, is the, it is the thing that will never pass away, as Jesus said. His Word endures forever. It's the Word that you and I need to speak, no matter what we're facing She proclaimed his word to strengthen her. The third thing I want you to see as we close in our time, she announced his judgment to settle her. She announced the Lord's judgment to settle her. Verse 9, skipping down to the last section here, she concludes her prayer like this, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces. (laughs) From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And then she mentions that wonderful prophecy, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Right here, she is setting her sights on the coming Messiah and him setting everything right. You know, she announced his judgment to be able to settle her, realizing that, yes, in this life, things don't always go as they seem or they plan or we plan. Things aren't fair. Yes, as Anna reminds me every day. (laughs) Our firstborn, by the way, she's the policeman, woman. Um, When you get bogged down by the weight of this world, the cares of this life, things aren't going the way you wished. You can settle your heart realizing that God has got an end game He's got a plan to right every wrong. He's got this whole thing figured out. And you and I declaring that judgment, it can seem brutal. It can seem tough, especially a world that doesn't want to know about God's judgment. They don't want to know about the Lord's return. They don't want to have responsibility for the realities of fulfilled prophecy and the things in the world happening as scriptures say. They'd rather not, they'd rather tune you out. But you know what? To the believer, You and I can have a settled heart in knowing that God is going to bring these things about. And it says in Philippians 4, 4 through 5, we we talked about this briefly last week, but remember, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then it says, Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. And I reminded you last week, the reason why you and I should be gentle and loving is because the Lord is near. That, that, That means He's, he's coming soon. That means he's got it figured out. You don't have to get ahead, push your way around, have to be harsh or hard or try to make things happen the way you want. No, be gentle because things can flip like that when we talk about the Lord's return. In fact, I remember and appreciate what Michael shared 
when Michael was here just a couple of weeks ago from Philippians 3, 20 through 21, remember our citizenship is in heaven. And we eager, do you eagerly await the Savior? We eagerly await the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, transform our lowly bodies so that they will be made to his glorious body. Folks, when we realize that this is not all that there is, and God has a plan of judgment, He has a plan to set everything right, He has a plan to make you and I right when we don't feel right and things are not going right. When you and I know that there is an end game, there is a time, there is a destined date, that this stuff all gets figured out and worked out, it can settle our hearts, can't it? So I'd say to encourage you, (laughs) when you're going through some tough stuff, having to make some tough decisions, would you familiarize yourself with God's end game? Go to conferences huh, that talk about Bible prophecy, reminding us of the times. Come, come to our shameless plug for September 11th. Come to our, our prophecy conference here that we're sharing. Familiarize yourself with the Lord's end game. Know that He is on His way. And the only delay, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, is because He wants to bring salvation to men as there's time that is left. <laughs> now, now, those three things consult or make up her prayer, and I think are a blessing, uh, definitely to my heart and yours, going through some tough stuff, and hopefully can establish and encourage and strengthen you when you've got to deal with some tough things. Verse 11, and then I want to I conclude this because there's, there's a little bit more to the story that we got to add here. Uh, verse 11, it says, Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered unto the Lord before Eli the priest. That's what I'm doing, and that's what ultimately you do when you come to church. Did you know that? You're not ministering uh, to anybody primarily or yourself, but except unto the Lord. That's why when you and I bring the sacrifice of praise, we do what He asks us to because we're serving Him when we're here. All of us are serving Him when we're here, not ourselves, right? We are serving our family, bringing them here, but ultimately we're serving the Lord when we come and sit and sing and listen, read, fellowship. We're not here for ourselves, right? And so, so that's what Samuel began to do immediately. Now, listen in verse 12, the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. We'll talk about that next week. It's sad, very sad. We're going to hit some, talking about deep lessons, we're going to hit some hard lessons in parenting next week. Please come. I'll bring donuts, you know, come back, please. (laughs) Continuing on in verse 18, though, listen to this. But Samuel, contrast to the sons of Eli, ministered before the Lord, even as a child, Wearing the linen ephod, that is, he proved himself to be so uh, faithful in service to the Lord that he was even doing things in the priesthood that much older men were being entrusted with, but they weren't available because their sons were obviously corrupt, so he was even able to do that. Moreover, his mother, verse 19, used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. And I think that's just a nice little addition to remind us that she, she wanted him to remember why he was there. He was there to serve the Lord. She was an intentional parent to remind him of his work and who he is. And that's what we as parents need to be, reminding our children why they're here and what they're doing here. Not to serve themselves, not to go, you know, plan their destiny or reach for the stars as it relates to them, but it's to serve the Lord with their life and reminding them and and, and investing in that. And that's what she's doing. She's investing in that. And Eli, verse 20, it says, would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, the Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. <laughs> that is, when she returned them, again, it's the Lord's, ultimately. Then they would go from their home and listen, the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three more sons, two daughters. Meanwhile, the child of Samuel grew before the Lord. I can't think of a better picture I've seen shared than this on the internet here recently as it relates to our lives and to sacrifice. You know, it's hard to to turn over in tough times and say, Lord, I embrace your plan of humility for me. 
Lord, it's hard to bring the sacrifice of praise. That is, that I'm going to, with the fruit of my lips, proclaim your word. I'm going to speak your truth. I'm going to sing when there's a time to sing. I'm going to speak who you are, not just Sunday morning, but wherever I go, because God, you're worthy of that. You're worthy of that praise. That's not easy. You got to be intentional. It's not easy. And then, and then I realized, too, that, 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 that when it comes to studying prophecy and trying to study about things, you've got to go out of your way a little bit to learn about some of those things. But, but it does settle your heart. It does settle your heart. But in all of these things, you've got to sacrifice time, energy, effort. You've got to give your life over to the Lord. You do. And yet, there are so many things that we're holding back and saying, Lord, no, I don't want... Uh. Going to church, oh, I'll go when it's convenient, but... You know, when you make it a priority to, to have open hands, hands wide open to the Lord, He does better, right? Right. When I say, Lord, I'll give you Samuel, there's five more that come. Isn't that amazing to see? Job, remember Job? Why are you bringing up Job again? Yes, but you remember how the story ends. He turned over his life for a season, but got more than doubled back, Right? That's how it works with the Lord. You trust Him with what you sacrifice, you bring to Him today. He'll always do that and then some with your life and mine. Pray with me. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth that doesn't change. <laughs> the lessons of Scripture that are for our profit. All of Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable, we agree. And Lord, even today, these lessons that you want to teach us today, I pray that they wouldn't just be heard, but we would see you face to face. We would experience what you want us to in these deep and hard times that we're living in, and even in our individual lives, the things that we're going through, God, that we would be having settled hearts, confident, Jesus, in you, looking to you as our, our Savior, the one that has made us more than a conqueror, because in everything we've already won. Lord, give us that confidence, Lord. Help us by your Spirit. And Lord, ultimately, I think the word today that, that I want to part with and remember is sacrifice, being able to hand over to you what is yours anyway so that I could receive, Lord, from you much better. Lord, help us to do that as a congregation so that we could see change happen in our lives that is obviously shown here in the life of Hannah and Elkanah and in Israel, ultimately, Lord, you desire that even for us. Lord, help us. If there's somebody here today that does not know you, uh, none of these things apply. They can't have these things apart from you, Jesus. I pray that they would see they need a Messiah. They need a Savior, like uh, Hannah admitted there at the end. <laughs> Lord, that they would trust and believe that you paid the price for them, that they could be saved today, and they could receive your spirit, walk in newness of life. Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask as we close here in worship that you would start letting, help us letting go of the grip that we might have on this life today so we could live our lives more fully for you, experiencing the glories and the joys of walking in you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Where Pastor Jim asked if we'd close with a, a new song, um, which ties in really great with the message. Um, very easy to catch on to, a little repetitive, but it uh, really works out as just a, a prayer. Um, almost thinking about what um, Hannah would be praying when she was praying for Samuel. So if you want to stand, we'll, uh, we'll close in worship, and then we'll end with a song that we mostly know.
sing that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to you, God, trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me. Love to see you Tuesday if you can. Otherwise, you're dismissed for this week. Love you. If you need anything, holler. So have a good week.